Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the Wisconsin Veterans Museum for another fantastic book talk. I see many of you are still connecting with audio, so we'll give everybody just a second to cycle through the waiting room and uh, get everything set up. I hope everybody's having a fantastic Monday. Uh, it's a great day in here in Madison. No Canadian wildfire smoke to speak of. The weather's really nice. Uh, our speaker, on the other hand, is down in Texas, where I hear by news reports, it's extremely hot. Um, looks like everybody's come through so far. Fantastic. So like I said, my name is Eric Wright. I'm the Education Director here for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up for our book talk today with Lisa Jaster. Uh, before we get started, though, I just want to remind everybody that all of our virtual programs are brought to you by the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation. So I'd like to thank them for their continued support in providing all of the virtual programs that we get to put out there for free every single month. Not only our book talks, our trivia nights, uh, our movie discussion nights, our drink and draw events. Uh, we have a lot of fantastic virtual events out there. And of course, you can always find them on our website, wisvetsmuseum.com slash events. And all of our virtual events are free. Uh, so thank you once again to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation. And of course, support for the foundation coming in the memory of Pat Finley. So thank you as well to the Finley, Finley family also. I just also want to remind everybody today that we do have our security features enabled. Uh, so no, uh, nobody will be able to start their video or unmute themselves. Uh, but if you do have any questions for our author, which we will do a question and answer session at the end, uh, you can always submit those directly to me via the chat function here. I'll be populating a PowerPoint with all the questions that come through as usual uh, and bringing that up at the end so everybody can see uh, the questions and not just the author, but also our audience members as well. Uh, and while we are on the topic of our author, today's author is Lisa Jaster. Uh, she is an American soldier, combat engineer, and one of the first three women to graduate the elite United States Army Ranger program in 2015. Uh, this is one of the most difficult combat training courses in the world, and Lisa was the first reservist to complete the course. And she graduated, this is spectacular, she graduated at the age of 37, while the average trainee's age was 23 years old. So that's hardcore. Uh, prior to receiving her steam Ranger tab, Lisa worked as an engineer with Shell Oil in Houston and as an Army Reserve indiv Individual Mobilization Augmentee with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Lisa initially was commissioned in the Army in 2000 after graduating from the United States Military Academy at West Point and returned to the Reserves in 2012 after a five-year hiatus from serving. And Lisa is also the recipient of numerous military accolades into including two bronze stars and a meritorious service medal. Alisa holds a BS and MS in civil engineering, and she is currently a partner in the War Talent Group, a management consulting and executive search firm, uh, where she focuses on her efforts on training, manage, training management teams, executive coaching, and keynote speaking. And she's here today to talk with us about her book, Delete the Adjective, which relives Lisa's experiences in Ranger School, as was noted in her, her field notebook, which every single ranger carries with them while they're in training. Lisa, welcome to the program today. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. And as a, um, a person who was raised in Wisconsin, I'm, I'm really excited to participate in this event. Excellent, excellent. We're happy to have you. I will turn the floor over to you and I will take any questions. I just want to remind everybody through the chat function here on Zoom. Uh, Lisa, the floor is yours though. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, to everybody listening, I am going to I am going to show some PowerPoint slides. It's only so that you get a little bit more of an idea of who I am, because sitting on Zoom is makes it rather difficult. But before that, I do that. I'd like to start with a brief story, and and that's really um, where the title of this book came from. So my book, the one we're talking about today, it's called it's called Delete the Adjective: um, A Soldier's Adventures in Ranger School. And if you could see the title, uh, all the adjectives are crossed out. And there's a reason for that. When I was in seventh grade, the first Gulf War happened. So we're talking August of 1990 to February of 1991. During that period of time, I turned 13. For my 13th birthday, my grandmother sent me a book called In the Men's House. It was written by a woman named Carol Barkalow. Carol wrote this book as a 1980 graduate of the United States Military Academy. She's one of the first women to have ever 
had the opportunity to go to West Point. Um, and it, her experiences in that book were very intriguing to me. And I thought, wow, this is really hard. At the same time, the Gulf War was going on. And I am watching TV as a child whose only heroes had been movie stars and people who pretended to do really amazing things. And now here I am and I'm watching real people, people from Wisconsin, like my hometown, people from small neighborhoods across the U.S. that are now overseas fighting for the, the freedoms of, in, in this case, of the Iraqi people. And I was... I was completely enamored and thought the culmination of those two events happening simultaneously motivated me to go to West Point. So in seventh grade, I decided I was going to go to West Point. And here I am all excited that I had made this huge life decision at such an early age. And what do I do? I start, I start telling people, hey, I'm going to go to West Point. I want to join the army. And I was constantly combated with, but you're a girl, you're a female. Can women even go? Why would a woman want to go to this? And I never thought anything of it. But as the years progressed and I went to the military academy and I then became a civil engineer, I worked as a combat engineer both in um, Afghanistan in 2001 and, and in Iraq in 2002 and continued, I'm sorry, in 2002, I was in Afghanistan, 2003, I was in Iraq. I continued to get this, yeah, but women can't be in combat. Okay, well, please tell that to the females I have who are occupying foxholes and who are out there doing convoys every single day in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I was, um, I always thought, wow, why does this, this adjective matter? To move forward and the actual naming of the book is in 2016, January 2016, I was invited to President Barack Obama's final State of the Union address, and I was a guest of Mrs. Michelle Obama. I got to sit in the president's wife's box at the State of the Union, and I got to invite one guest to come with me and watch the State of the Union from a viewing room within the Capitol building. And when I invited my friend, that friend happened to be somebody who's very, very active in politics, and her name is Sue Fulton. And she happens to also be part of an LGB activist group. And during, during that time, things had just changed. Um, marriage, gay marriage was approved. And so it was considered a huge statement that I was inviting Sue. Now, the interesting point of this is Sue is also a really good friend of the lady who wrote the book that inspired me to go to West Point. Sue is also one of the first women to ever graduate from the United States Military Academy. Sue is, a, is someone who drove to Fort Benning, Georgia to pick me up on, uh, when I had found out I was going to graduate, organized a party for me and my family and did a lot for me with regards to Ranger School, as well as paving the way for for females in the military period. And the funniest thing is we're, she and I are standing there going through security to get into the White House. And she looks over at me and she's like, there's all these responses about me being your gay friend. And I said, well, that's silly. And she goes, yeah, sometimes I wish people would just delete the adjective. Why can't I just be your friend? So there's where the title of the book came from. It's called Delete the Adjective. So I tell all that lengthy story, and now I want to introduce you to me just a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully everyone will be able to see it okay. But the first slide is a collection of really who I am. Um, so you're going to see I am a hunter. I am a mom. I am a sister. You don't see this in here, but Still in Wisconsin, I have several brothers and sisters, but I am the second oldest of eight children. I like to do strength training. I used to compete in CrossFit. I still compete in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, so, and on the top right corner, you'll see Hurricane Harvey happened while I was living in Houston. My husband and I, both being veterans, decided to put our wetsuits on and we went door to door because the city's first responders, the police, um, 
the medics, they weren't allowed to get out of their boats to go help people because the city was worried that they would also get caught up in the undertows and the storms. Well, since we weren't um, held back by any restrictions, we were just interested citizens. My husband and I ended up spending five or six days where we would just go out to the first responders in their boats and say, hey, we found people in here. Can we bring them to you? Can we help here? And, and we actually ended up getting our own boats and, and we're able to help people out. So this is just a really brief overview of who I am before I start telling you the story of, of the book. Okay, so um, Ranger School is not something that everybody's familiar with. Uh, if you're interested in the military museum, the Veterans Museum in Wisconsin, then you ha probably have some affiliation. But even those who are in the military aren't 100% aware of what's going on at Ranger School. It is a three-phase course that starts with a testing week. And we call it the Ranger Assessment Phase. It's an equivalent to a Hell Week. I do not compare it at all to Navy SEAL training or special forces training. Ranger training is something very, very different, but it is considered a key, if not one of the best leadership courses in the world. People come from all over the world. I graduated with um, officers from four different nations that came to this school to, to represent their nation and be able to take back some of the leadership development that we learned while we were there. And within the book, I outline extensively these phases and I talk about passing and failing, but I'll tell you one quick story. And that is day zero. So all of the Ranger School students have to show up on day zero. It's the day we do all of our paperwork. The class that I showed up for was the very first class where women were allowed. 19 women showed up on that first day, and there was just short of 400 people overall. Now, that's the first day we did paperwork. Only one person didn't pass their paperwork and make it to day one. Day one was the physical fitness test, and it's something that everybody knows they're going to have to do. It's two minutes of push-ups, two minutes of sit-ups, a five-mile run, followed by six chin-ups. Out of just that very first day. So day zero was the administrative portion. Day one was that physical fitness test. Almost 25% of the people that showed up, so they shaved their head, kissed their families goodbye, grabbed their two authorized duffel bags and flew to Fort Benning, Georgia. 25% of those people didn't even make it to breakfast on the first day. And wrap week is four days long. So there's just an example of, of what that first day looks like. Now, going back to day zero, so the day before we actually started the course, we had a time frame where we needed to show up. And this goes back to the delete the adjective concept in the book. As I called a cab, and because the first day at Ranger School is very busy for cab drivers, people usually don't fly down to Ranger School to drop their, their soldiers off. So the cabs are really busy. So a minivan ended up coming to pick me up. So I'm in the minivan and I asked the cabbie, hey, listen, I know I'm not going to eat good food for nine weeks because that's how long Ranger School is. Let's go ahead and um, stop by Subway. So we sat by Subway, I got some food, I'm sitting in the back of this minivan, eating as fast as I can, and the cabbie stops to pick up more people to go to ranger school. And it was two really young guys. The average age of students at, West, or at ranger school is about 22 years old. And up to this point, only male, since the 50s, when the school started. And the guys start throwing their bags in the back of the minivan and they go to climb in and right away, hey, cabbie, um, we're going to ranger school. There's a girl in this vehicle. Um, you know, we can't be late. This isn't going to work for us. And the cab driver was so proud. Oh, you don't know who she is. She's one of the first women to go to ranger school. It was as if he was my dad dropping me off for college. And his excitement was a little bit contagious. I started getting, hey guys, haven't you heard? You're gonna be in the first integrated class. 
And as you would expect, any hard charging young guy who's headed to an elite school, not only is he shocked, but both of these young men are a little taken back, almost offended that women, they're going to be in the first class with women. So they're, they're going to be in the first easy class or the first whatever. Um, and of course, everything they're feeling is negative at the time, which I totally accept. Well, they ended up getting in the van and it was only about a 15 minute drive to take us to the drop off point for ranger school. And during that time, I shared my cookies from my subway. And if you know anything about me or you know anything about ranger students, sharing food is, that's a true sacrifice. So I sacrificed my cookies, broke some bread with these gentlemen. In that 15 minutes from them refusing to get in the van until we arrived at the installation on Fort Benning, um, something changed in them. Something changed. They started with, hey, I don't want to be there with the females. I don't want to be in the first integrated class. To when we got out of the van, we dumped our bags where everybody put their bags. And the first ranger instructor came up to me and said, hey, you're a female. You need to go um, you need to go get a urinalysis. We need to make sure you're not pregnant before you start this very difficult school. Completely acceptable, completely understandable. So I'm, I'm okay. I, I completely understand. I have to go, I have to go get a, uh, a urinalysis. So as I'm headed that direction, the, uh, the two young men start running with me because if you're a ranger student, you run everywhere you go. Suddenly I've got these two young men running with me to the aid station, which is about half a mile away. And they said, well, we're, we're coming with you. And the ranger instructor starts yelling at them. And one of them turns around and looks at the ranger instructor and, and yells part of the ranger creed. Now the ranger creed is a six paragraph creed that we have to memorize and repeat before every meal. And it's it's something that ranger students and rangers live by. And part of that creed is I will never leave a fallen comrade. So here we have these two gentlemen who didn't even think I should be there in 15 minutes, not even wanting me to go to the aid station by myself. Of course, the funny part of the story is the, the ranger instructor just yelled at him, she's going to pee in a cup. She's not dying, boys. You're not leaving a fallen comrade. So it ended up being a great experience, but it was also an eye opener to me who was ready. I was ready for all the resistance. I was ready for all the pushback. I was ready for everyone to think, hey, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be doing these things. So I was... Um, I was pretty excited to see that these young people were already accepting me. So I'm keeping up this slide just for a second because I want you to be able to see all the statistics and to really understand what Ranger School looks like. There's a couple of facts I wanna tell you. Um, it's supposed to be a nine week course. If you don't recycle at all and you go straight through, it takes nine weeks. I actually did repeat several sections of the course, and I ended up being there for uh, six months, which is um, a little embarrassing, but also just part of my story. And then if you're there for just nine weeks, you walk on average 200 miles. That's the average during that nine-week period of time. Also, if you're there just for nine weeks, the average work day is 19 and a half hours. Now, before we do any high-risk uh, missions like jumping out of airplanes, they uh, TRADOC, the training, training command, has to give us eight hours of sleep so we'll, we are well-rested and don't injure ourselves. So remember, it was an average of a 19 and a half hour workday. Now take that and calculate calculate in at least once every three weeks, we had to get eight hours of sleep. Those, uh, those bedtime numbers go down pretty quickly. You eat on average two meals a day. Uh, I say that to say I usually ate one at three in the morning and then the next one at 3.30. And then you walked all day and then uh, repeated the, the meal structure the next night. So um, there's something to be said about that. There was a lot of for people who like to do the, the fasting, it was mandatory fasting for uh, intermittent fasting for all of the ranger school students for the, the totality of their time there. 
Um, I'm going to stop sharing for just a second, and I just want to talk about the why of the book. So the why of the book for me um, was, as Eric had mentioned, I originally had just written in my pocket notebooks. So you had to have a notebook in your pocket and a pen at all times. So you could write down mission requirements, you could write down what was going on, you could know who's in what positions, because everything's constantly changing at Ranger School. So while I was writing those things down, there's also a requirement that you stay awake and alert. And if you remember me saying the average of a 19 and a half hour work day, 200 miles walked, the packs we were carrying were between 60 and 100 pounds, depending on whether or not you had a radio. You're tired. So to keep myself awake, I would write letters to my family in these little green notebooks. And I wrote down everything. I wrote what meal ready to eat I had picked out of the random grouping. I wrote down which of my classmates was being a jerk and which one was being a good battle buddy. I wrote everything down in hopes of staying awake. And at the end of ranger school, my husband and my parents had trash bags full of these little notes and they were only, you know, two inches by four inches. And it'd be pages on pages that I just would crumple up, put in an envelope and, and mail home. They had all of these notes. And then I had my field notebooks as well. So at one point in time, I have two children. My kids were six and two when I went away to ranger school, right before I started, my daughter turned three. And then while I was at ranger school, my son turned seven. So I graduated ranger school with a three and a seven year old. And I missed six months of their very early child development. And this is this is critical time. If you're a parent, you know, this is when they learn how to ride a bike. This is when um, my son learned that girls were gross or whatever seven-year-olds do. Uh, this was the time when they were learning about religion at church and they start, they went from having, you know, daycare to going to Bible study. There was a lot of things that were happening in their life that I just missed. So once I got back from ranger school, I was very, very deliberate in taking all of these notes that I had sent and that I had written and typing them out chronologically. And in all honesty, it was over 700 pages of single spaced notes, which is horribly boring. And I knew nobody would read it to include my children. But that's what I did with it anyways, just in case my kids ever wanted to know why I missed so much of that critical time in their very young lives. That's who I wrote my notes for. But what happened in 2021, 2022, is I started to have conversations with people who wanted to dig deeper into the idea of integrating the armed forces or why would I go to ranger school? Because I didn't turn into an infantryman. I didn't give up being an engineer. I haven't gone active duty. So why would a 37-year-old mother of two shave her head and leave everything? So I started working this basically notebooks upon notebooks of my meandering thoughts into a storyline but I wasn't quite sure who the audience was. And as I started talking to people, I realized there was a very specific audience out there. There are women who wanna try hard things and do something that maybe is not typical for females, which could be working in the STEM industry or um, small town, just moving out of the small town. There, there was definitely an audience of middle-aged women and I don't think me as 45 is middle-aged, but I keep getting told that I am, uh, that middle-aged women who maybe want to make a change, that that would be a key audience. But I realized as I started doing speaking events and continued to work in the talent management organization, I'm a partner in the talent war group, as Eric mentioned earlier, what I didn't, what I didn't realize is the people who wanted to hear more of my story were predominantly these young fire-breathing men 
that would say things to me like, I don't want a woman the same age as my aunt out there on the battlefield with me. I don't want to share a foxhole with someone like you. And what I realized was they didn't know a someone like me. They didn't know that I like bow hunting and that I like being out in the woods and that serving my country was something I've wanted to do since I was 13 years old. And not kind of, hey, I want to grow up and play army, but I want to go to West Point, be a commissioned officer and fight our nation's wars was a decision I made at 13. And I think if, and I thought if people could read my story, if people could understand what was going on inside my head, then they might think of integration differently. And it's not a gender integration story. The story is about, hey, let's have people who deserve to do the job, who want to do the job, who are capable of doing the job, let's have them do the job, regardless of the adjectives. And if no women pass ranger school, then fine. Then no women deserve to be in the ranger units. And, and that is really the message I wanted to get across is that I'm not trying to be the first female. I'm trying to be somebody who wants to do these things and actually accomplishes them. So I'm going to go on to a couple other stories, but before I do, I want to say, um, I know Eric put it in the chat, but my favorite part of these types of conversations is really the conversation part. So please ask questions, um, send them to Eric, post them in the chat so that we can talk about them in about 15 minutes when, when we get to that point. I want to go back to the slides and show a few things that inspired me. Again, one of the things I was saying earlier is that I wasn't doing this because I wanted to be a woman who ach achieved and accomplished this. I wanted to do this because I wanted to go to ranger school. My dad graduated from ranger school in 1968, following um, moving forward to do three tours in Vietnam, earning a silver star. Uh, he also had four purple hearts. Um, He's a recipient of four Purple Hearts and was quite an impressive soldier. I wanted to be like him. And the fact that people were still telling me, but you're a female, didn't really make sense to me because I had that drive. I had the fitness. I had the capability. I had the experience in Afghanistan and Iraq. I had been out there. I had led convoys. I wanted people to respect me for who I was. So at no point in time in writing this book, was the adjective what I wanted to focus on. And I hope if you have read the book or if you plan on reading Delete the Adjective, that this is more, this slide right here is what you get out of it. And what this is, is don't let the quit in. I watched a Ultimate Fighting Championship show. I'm not sure if any of you watch this. It's, um, it's MMA fighting, mixed martial arts. And there is the first female to be put in the UFC Hall of Fame. Her name is Ronda Rousey, and she was one of the coaches on the TV show. The TV show is a reality show where various fighters and various weight classes compete with other teams to try to get a opportunity to fight in the UFC, which is the highest level of mixed martial arts um, fighting arenas. And Rhonda, one of her fighters, didn't make weight. So he was five pounds too heavy for his fight the morning of his fight, but he had all day to lose those final five pounds. And anyone who's familiar with even high school wrestling, you understand that you can definitely lose water weight in a day. So she had him in a steam shower. She had him spitting in a cup. She had him riding a bike in a sauna, trying to lose five pounds of water weight throughout the day. And at what point in time, Rhonda's fighter said through a locked door, I can't do it. I'm going to drink water. And as it stuck with me, her response, she said, you might not make weight, but whatever you do, don't quit. Because once you let the quit in, it has a foot in the door. 
And this was something I carried with me throughout Ranger School was this cheesy reality TV show, Ronda Rousey telling some guy who just wanted a sip of water, don't let the quit in. And later, while I was at the school, a very senior ranking officer that I respect with all of my heart and soul had written me a letter and said, don't you ever quit. But if you do quit for some crazy reason, make sure it's something that you can proudly call home about. And he went on in his letter and he talked about quit criteria. So quit criteria is something I've adopted because there are things you should quit. A bad relationship, a toxic diet, a, a job that's that's just sucking your soul away. There are things out there that you should quit. So saying never let the quit in is, is not right either. But what is your quit criteria? What is it that would allow you to quit something and still hold your head up high and call your mom and say, hey, listen, I had to walk away from this. So for me at Ranger School, my quit criteria became, I had a lower body compound fracture because I figured I couldn't go on if, if that happened, or someone in my immediate family died. And those were the two things. And I wrote them on a, another piece of paper and I put it in my hat and I carried it with me to remind myself when I was having a bad day, when I was tired, when I was hungry, when I was cold, when I was wet, what can I do? Well, I can't quit because I'm not severely injured, lower body injury, and nobody, there's been no deaths in my immediate family. Well, my quick criteria got tested several times throughout ranger school. I ended up tearing um, something in my right shoulder. I had, I'm sorry, my left shoulder. I ended up having surgery on my left shoulder a year after I graduated from ranger school. At some point in time, we were on monkey bars. We had our, our water bladders on our back. The monkey bars were wet. We were swinging over water. And I fell and tried to hold on for dear life and something in my shoulder tore. I still finished ranger school. I actually got back up on the obstacle and finished that as well. Uh, we won't talk about the throbbing, but it was an injury. It was potentially a reason to quit. And nobody would have thought twice if I said, I tore a ligament, my shoulder, I can't go on. I'll try again later if they open ranger school to women again. Well, that, that wasn't my quit criteria. So I went through the rest of the ranger school, babying my left shoulder, uh, trying hard to secure my ruck straps, my backpack straps in a way that supported the shoulder rather than pulled the arm out. And I ended up obviously not quitting. The second test of my will and my quit criteria uh, and you can see by my face in that picture of me buddy carrying crumb that uh, I definitely was pushed to my physical limits, but my mental limits got tested when I was in Florida. Florida is the third phase of ranger school. It's so you have wrap week, which I talked about being four days of being truly tested during um then the first real phase, when you talk about the three phases, is Darby, which, you know, we talk about that being maybe the crawl phase. The next phase is mountains, and that's the walk phase. Things get a little harder, a little more complicated. The terrain's a lot more difficult to navigate. And then the third and final phase is Florida, or swamps. Now, swamps is the hardest because you're, you're moving as a unit. The unit's larger than in the first phase. Uh, there's no, Florida's flat. So when you're navigating the land, you can't say, okay, well, I'm on the top of the hill. There's a river. There's a mountain. I know where I am looking at a map. You have to actually just figure it out because GPS isn't allowed. You also have to navigate swamps. So you'll swim across a river and then you'll walk through swamps and then you'll take a boat down another part of the river and again go into a swamp where you're walking through waist high for most of the guys, which means it was armpit height for me and a lot of the other, shall we say, vertically challenged people. And But swamps is by far, it's the run phase. It is the hardest phase, but very few people fail or get recycled. 
And the reason why is you've been there for six weeks by this time, you know what you're doing, you know your class needs. Most people who make it to swamps ultimately graduate. Well, in my class, quite a few of us got recycled, which means we were told we had to do it all over again. Now, mentally, that's challenging enough that you'll have to do that third phase from the start of the third phase and, and restart it. But something else happened. So we only got our mail in between phases. So I get all my letters from my family and I get this very weird cryptic note from my husband that said, I'm not going to write anything for you, but you need to call your father as soon as possible. Well, I called my dad and he had found out while I was in Florida the first time that he had a terminal, extremely rare form of cancer. Less than 2,000 reported cases in the entire world of this type of cancer. And, and he, he was diagnosed with it. They had removed part of his jaw, started radiation, and were trying to figure out what to do. But because there were so few cases, there wasn't even an improved treatment. Um, so here I am talking on the phone to him, and here it's my father with terminal cancer. Now we go back to my quit criteria, and a death in the immediate family is definitely on, on that list. But he wasn't dead but he was dying. And I couldn't call my dad and say, hey, I wanna quit. My dad graduated from Ranger School in 1968. So instead I pretended to, uh, to suck it up and be okay. And I told him stories and he listened to me and said, oh, wow, you know, 40, 50 years ago, I walked those same grounds. I did those same missions. I bet some of the same people, some of the same trees, some of the same, land formations are still there. You're probably walking the same path I walked. And although everything in my heart and soul wanted me to quit, I had set that quick criteria. And I knew that there was nothing that would make it harder for my dad than if I had quit at that point in time. So that's why I'm saying these quotes here, you know, don't let the quit in. And I hope that's what comes out in my manuscript is talking about perseverance and, and really pushing through. I wanna tell a story about how, um, and it is in the book, at the start of the book, even getting to ranger school as a female was extremely difficult. Uh, I was a reserve officer, I am a reserve officer, I still serve, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel right now. And at that time, to go to ranger school, I had to get a ranger school physical. It's a very specific physical that's just for ranger school students. Well, no female had ever gotten a ranger school physical. And I thought, well, the entire Department of Defense knows this is going on. There were notes sent out to the entire U.S. military asking for female volunteers who were willing to do this. Everybody's got to know about it. So I called the local Army base and said, hey, um, I don't, I live four hours away. I'd like to drive to your medical facility and get a ranger school physical. And they said, well, no times two. One, you're a woman and you can't go to ranger school. And two, you're not active duty. So we won't give you a physical. So I got shut down. I got shut down before I even started. And no one knew what I should do because all but one of the other women that were trying to go were active duty. And the other woman that was trying to go was active guard reserve. So she wasn't active duty, but she was currently holding an active service role. So she could go see the military doctors, the army doctors. So I wasn't going to let the quit in. I wasn't going to quit before I started. And it would have been really easy to do so. But instead, I grabbed a checkbook and took a day off work, and I was living in Houston at the time, so I went to an emergency care facility, and at the emergency care facility, I said, here's the paperwork that needs to be filled out, and here's a blank check. What can we do to get me to yes? I, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to get me in the door. And the doc picked up that piece of paper and it said that they were supposed to check things that I didn't have and it ignored parts that I did have. 
it obviously was not a gender neutral form. To top it all off, because I was over the age of 35, I was considered an aged participant. So there was an entirely uh, separate side, like another whole column of things that I needed to get checked because not only did women not do this, but this is not a school for old people. And apparently over 35 in the army is old. I went from being middle-aged to aged. Well, after about six hours at um, that emergency care facility, we figured out a way to get me to yes. We got the documentation to the point where Ranger School would accept it. And when I sent it in, I did have to go back in for additional checkups because again, they didn't know what to do with us, but I got to yes. And that is a sign of resiliency and not letting the quit in. And, and basically, basically trying to endure. And again, that's really what I hope people get out of my manuscript if and when they have the opportunity to read it. I want to give you two more quick stories before we go to questions. Um, I think we're going to go to questions at 1245 Central Time. Um, the next story I want to tell you is about changing people's minds. Part of not letting the quit in is being allowed into the room. The first part of the story is just getting there. Um, the second part of the story was actually being on site and, and finally getting accepted. But this third part of the story is about changing people's mindsets. And I didn't have the training re required to go to ranger school. People who go to ranger school uh, train with a ranger prep platoon doing uh, physical fitness that is required for that school. They also do tactics that are required for that school. There's cheat sheets that people who had already graduate share with the younger Ranger platoon hopefuls. And there's, there's years for some of these people that go into getting them ready for Ranger school. A lot of them also try two or three times. Um, not all of them and not even most of them, but there are quite a few people who go to ranger school and fail, go back to their home unit, get retrained, and then and then try again, eventually succeeding. Of course, that's a great sign of resilience. But unfortunately for the women, this was an experiment. This was a test. They wanted to see if women could do it. So I couldn't quit. I couldn't go back home. I couldn't press restart, refresh. I had to finish. There was no second chances for me. So I wasn't in a regular army unit that could uh, train me up on land navigation, weapons systems, how to use pluggers and different GPS tools that the army was using now that they weren't using back when I was active duty. Um, there were radio systems that I used to know how to use, but I was so senior by this time that I hadn't touched a radio to fill it in probably a decade. I was supposed to jump out of airplanes while at Ranger School, and it had been since 1990s, 1998 since I had jumped out of a plane last, and this is 2015. I needed to get myself mentally, physically, and technically ready to go to this school. And... What ended up happening is no one in my unit could help me. My unit was in Alabama, but my husband's unit was actually in Texas. But here's the other twist. My husband is a Marine. He's not in the Army. So they have slightly different equipment, slightly different uh, tactics and techniques. And, and it's just one twist away from, from what the Army teaches. But it was the best I had. And so my husband went to his unit and said, hey, can anyone help my wife, specifically somebody who does this stuff, small unit tactics, on a regular basis? And a guy came up to my husband that was an active duty Marine and said, listen, I don't believe that women belong in combat arms, but if your wife wants to go, I want her to fail because women don't belong, not because nobody was willing to give her the tools she needed to succeed. So I walked in and this was January 1st, 2015, after I had already taken my blank checkbook to emergency care and gotten my physical. I had to get somebody to sign off on all of these technical and tactical skills. 
And I met up with uh, Gunnar Skinta and we sat down and we went through everything required. He got the arms room to bring out weapons. He brought, got the commo guy to bring out radios. He built an environment where I was able to be trained to be prepared for ranger school. And he sent me off at, to ranger school completely prepared for whatever the army was going to throw at me. And to this day is a good personal friend. And it all started with, I don't believe women should do this, but I want to make sure that if women aren't, can't do this, it's because they can't, not because they weren't given the tools to succeed. I mean, what an amazing human characteristic that is. What an amazing trait. So that's changing people's minds. Obviously, he supports me now. I'm friends with his wife. Uh, he's even supported me when I've done shooting competitions at this point. So that's how you change people's minds. But you also change people's uh, you, you also change future generations by not letting them quit in, by pushing through, by trying to excel. And I'm going to use one more story before we go to questions. Again, I'm really hoping that people are putting questions in the comment section. Um, and this final story is a story of my daughter. When I got back from ranger school, she was three years old. And our daycare was 0.93 miles from our house. So when the weather was nice in Houston, which as Eric already alluded to, it's a little warm down here, but when the weather was nice, I would walk her to or from daycare. And so I was home early from work one day, but it was a little chilly outside. So I'm wearing a hat because my head was still shaved and I decided, Hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go pick her up. So I ran to daycare and sh she and I decided we were going to run back. So we're running back and we lived inside the beltway. So it was, it was city streets and my, my little three-year-old stops and she's like, mommy, I need to talk to you. I'm like, Oh God, you know, what's going on in her little three-year-old mind. And she snatches my hat off her my head and it's got the little army symbol on the front and she pulls it down on her cute little face and gives me those big brown doe eyes and says hey mommy can boys go to ranger school too generations change if you push through and, and my story is a small one there are so many very important stories that are out there of people not letting the quit in of pushing through not not just military, but in a ton of different environments that are critical to making this world and making our neighborhoods a better place. And, and so I really hope what comes out of the manuscript, what comes out of delete the adjective, isn't just the gender integration portion, isn't just about the adjectives, but it's actually about not letting the quit in. And for that, I'm going to move forward and say, does anyone have any questions? My goodness, Lisa, I mean, how many, how many times did you have to overcome a hurdle or many hurdles just to, just to be able to get to where you wanted to be with that school? Everything was thrown in your path. My goodness. <laughs> That's why there's so many chapters in the book, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> and that last vignette about, uh, about your daughter asking if boys can go to ranger school too. I thought that was, that was magnificent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have many questions. Let me uh, bring my PowerPoint up here real quick. Let me get this started correctly. Uh, uh, the first question is, what? just uh, going back to the very beginning of your story, what was your experience at West Point like? My experience at West Point was absolutely fantastic. And I say that because I know a lot of people hear about sexism or issues with um, the genders at West Point. So I want to address that first. I had one instance where somebody inappropriately grabbed me while we were standing in line at the chow hall and I turned around and slapped him. And I was a freshman and it's definitely not something you should do, but it was my first reaction having older brothers. I knew darn well that nobody was going to grab my button formation. And what ended up happening was a testament to the professionalism of the guys that were there with me. Because although I, sh I completely behaved unprofessionally, everyone had my back. And I only hope that 
people can see that and women are empowered and men are empowered to stand up when they see something wrong happen. They definitely do that a lot. They try to teach that at the academies, but I also realize there's a lot of people that weren't raised by older brothers and their first response isn't to turn around and slap somebody's face. So I had that brotherhood, sisterhood that really supported me there. Um, that's the one question that people are usually asking when they talk about West Point, but I want to talk about the other part of West Point, which is people fight really hard to get in that school. And it's really fun to surround yourself with like-minded people who want to achieve the same way you want to achieve. My, my best friend in the whole world, she went to the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. And I remember one day I was being kind of cocky. I was being really pompous. I'm like, I got into West Point. She goes, yeah, I got into my first choice too. And she had this amazing experience at Eau Claire, has a great community from it. Well, I went to a school where everybody wanted to be in the army. Everybody wanted to serve their country. Not the same as Eau Claire, but definitely equally as powerful. So, you know, if that's the right community for you, that is definitely the right community for you. But it's not the right community for everyone, for sure. Yeah, and it definitely helps. Like you said, everybody is 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 a single focus. Um, and, and when you surround yourself with those people, it just makes your experience and, and your, your chances that much better. Yes, definitely. Um, and you mentioned also when you were in Ranger School that there was uh, service members from other countries. What, what was it like uh, training with, with those soldiers from other countries? Because I was a female, it definitely was a different experience. The guys would often talk about the fact that um, they were a little frustrated because the foreign officers was, were held to a different standard. I completely understand that they were because bringing foreign officers to a U.S. Army school isn't about the tactical or technical training as much as it is about reaching out and building relationships with those countries that are long-term relationships. But for me, because I was a female, that stuck out. The young lieutenant that was there from the Mexican Army, he still writes me. They're trying to do more integration in the Mexican Army right now. And he will say, hey, this is what I was thinking. Do you have a book I can recommend to some of my female soldiers? And he'll reach out to me. But then we also had people from, we'll just say Eastern Bloc countries, that have very different concepts of how men and women should behave, like different cultural expectations. And I had one partner who absolutely refused to pull his share of the load because he wanted to see me fail. So it was it was a very mixed bag, but I think it you know, culturally, we get that in the U.S. as well. We have so many different points of view. So it was it was good for me, um, but it was great in the fact that Ranger School wasn't different. They didn't keep the foreign officers out just because we were trying to integrate the uh, the class in 2015. Yeah, and I really like that story you told about the Marine uh, that your husband kind of recruited to help you out, you know, and basically saying, you know, you're going to fail because you're a female, not because you don't have the training. I'm going to give you the training. And yes. I thought that was, as much as it was not great to hear him say that he wanted you to fail because you're a female, at least he had the sense to, to be able to give you that sort of training, give you the tools that you needed to be able to succeed. And then, of course, you went off and succeeded. Yes. And he has two daughters that are both hard as woodpecker lips. So <laughs> now he's reaping what he sowed. <laughs> I had not heard that euphemism before, but I'm going to have to remember that one. <laughs> uh, let's see, the next question. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, well, you know, what was the most, I, I, this was my question. I always ask this of all of our authors. What is the most difficult part of, of investing yourself into a book like this? Even if you have 700 single spaced uh, pages typed, uh, is there still got to be some, you know, some very difficult parts in putting it all together. So that the answer to that question is twofold. The first one is what do other people care about? Because I know what I cared about. I cared about that my, because I originally wrote it for my kids. Hey, I missed you. I cried myself to sleep this night. Nobody cares about that. There's some moms out there that'll read the book and be like, ooh, I know what you were feeling right here. And there's definitely dads out there that'll um, empathize as well. Because um, our, our military is predominantly male. And we often forget that guys love their kids too. But 
I'm allowed to say it. And sometimes that uh, masculine atmosphere that's required to be in the military, the, the guys can't say it. So, um, you know, how much do I want to express missing my kids? How important is that to the reader? Especially if I if I pick the audience and say, hey, I want people to, to get to know me as a person. Um, so that was the first thing that was really hard is picking what would um, be impactful to others. And then the second difficult part was, you know, Ranger School is a leadership course. It's definitely a gentleman's course, but it's not always gentlemanly. So sometimes the vernacular, um, being the only female in the, during the last two phases, I was the only woman and there was 60 some odd men. So it's hard to explain the experience where you don't talk about the naked dudes. So how deep do you go into the, when I'm quoting somebody, yes, there's F-bombs all over the book. And they're like, I, my son started listening to the audiobook. He goes, um, mom, I'm okay with this stuff, but it's the fact that you're reading it. And I don't really want to hear my mom say those things. So, you know, what, what, level of true experience do you want to come out? So those were the two hardest things is what do people want to hear? And then how real are you? And if you've been in the military, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, for sure. There's there's a lot of stories and a lot of things that I would not have want to have to retell to my kids, although they're <laughs> both, uh, you know, military. Um, so they they understand better, but I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, I can't see my question. What inspired you? What you you kind of talked about this initially. Um, you know, what inspired you to join the military in the first place and graduate from West Point? But more specifically, how did that change uh, just over a year later once you graduated with 9/11? You know, 9/11 is a really uh, hard topic for all of us. 9/10 um, actually was a really hard day for me. One of my young specialists had, um, his girlfriend had broken up with him and he had shot himself in the head uh, the day before. So the evening of 9-10 and 9-11, I was still, um, when the first plane hit the first tower, I was leaving neuro ICU. So I, I was headed straight from neuro ICU to the office, even though my commander was like, hey, we know you were in the hospital all night, just go home. I'm like, I can't. I I ended up with uh, power of attorney because we couldn't find a living relative of this guy. And we had to make life or death decisions for my poor soldier who had a bullet lodged in his head. He did survive, by the way. And that's actually a really feel good story for another day and another time. But I came into 9-11 with all of that from 9-10. But then 9-12 is good, bad, or indifferent is one of my favorite days in history because our nation came together. And for somebody who was already in uniform, who was already serving to drive home and see, it didn't matter if I lived in Savannah, Georgia, and I lived in this brownstone right by this uh, bar that did drag shows every night. And to see the pride pla flag next to the American flags and see all of the, the nation coming together, regardless of demographic, regardless of background, regardless of um, who you are as an individual, you became part of the American unit. And for me, 9-11 was a moment where it really solidified my desire to serve. And when I got deployed, which was soon after, um, it was very early in uh, the following year in 2002, I felt like I felt like I had been redshirted my whole life and I was finally being put in the game and I could finally be impactful and I could finally be those heroes that I saw during the first Gulf War on TV. So 9-11 is a terrible thing, but I am glad that I was in uniform and I am proud to serve. And that's probably the reason why I will continue to serve until they kick me out and say I'm too old and too many adjectives. No, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, you know, that the feeling after that uh, across the whole nation was extraordinary. Um, I, I I wanted to go and, and you know sign back up. I had just gotten out a couple years prior, and uh, boy, I was I was ready to sign those papers again. My wife yeah. was not going to let me at all, um, which was probably a, a smart decision on her part. Um, but yeah, just the feeling afterwards um, yeah. was magnificent. And then, like you said, you were already serving. You were already in uniform. Um, so, it, like you said, it just solidified your decision that you know you're you're down the right path. Definitely. 
These are great questions. Thank you. Um, you know, I, and this was a, this is one of my questions that I originally wrote. You know, what was the most difficult part of Ranger School? But you know, I, I, I thought about it for a second. What was the best part of Ranger School for you? I'm sure there's a lot of you know, and, and not not just graduating, but just going through the course as well. There was probably so many uh, times you're like, this is this is awesome. This is what I signed up for. Um, you know, so so what were some of your best parts in, in Ranger School? So that um, the Mexican lieutenant, who's now a major, uh, it's been so long, it's been eight years, uh, he, he still makes fun of me because we would climb these mountains and I have, I wish I had my uniform cap in here. I write in my patrol cap, look up, and it's from a, a Bible verse, but it's, and I, and I am, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I would, I would walk up these hills. I would walk up these mountains. I would be exhausted and I would look up and I would see the sunrise and it was gorgeous. And all I could think of was someday I want to share this with my family. Look, I'm sharing it with these guys. And I looked around and nobody looked like me and nobody acted like me and no one thought like me. And then we would sit around in the patrol base later and we would start talking. And the best part of ranger school is when we started talking and I had a smile on my face, which of course these young 20 somethings were like, what the hell is wrong with this lady? Um, and that's when they started calling me mama ranger. And I would talk to them. I'm like, did you see the sunrise? And they're like, I did. And suddenly it was this positive environment but in that process of peeling back the layers of differences, I got to see, number one, we're all still motivated by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The Gen Zers, Gen Yers, Millennials, all those young people that we like to make fun of don't actually stink that bad. They're actually really good people. They just communicate differently because they were raised differently. And, and so I really got to learn about generational bias in the process of being a ranger school student. And I got to, I now have friends where I understand they're 15 years younger than me, but I, I get them. And I think, I think that's something other than shared suffering. I don't know that I could have gotten that. And I enjoyed it while I was there. It's not just something that I love retrospect in retrospect, but I actually enjoyed it while I was there. I enjoyed watching a 23 year old do yoga instead of going straight to sleep because he knew he needed to stretch to be more physically capable the next day. Excellent. I think we have just a couple more, a couple okay. more here. Uh, you spoke about the leadership aspects of Ranger School as well. Um, and what leadership traits have you taken with you from Ranger School into the civilian world that you think are super important to you? And this dovetails perfectly into what I was just talking about with that general generationalism is that I now keep a sticky on my computer that says, speak the way people need to hear you. And what happened leadership wise in Ranger School is that I'm a little old army and, and Eric, you, you already dated yourself. So you can say, you know what I'm talking about. The old army was thou shalt. I'm an officer. I tell you, you do. Everybody complains about it, but they did it anyways. Well, that's not the younger generation. We're too digital. We're too connected. Everybody can have the answer with Google in 30 seconds. So sometimes uh, you dictate and you say, hey, we got to make this happen and we got to make it happen now. But to get to the point where you can do that, sometimes you need to say, hey, we've got an extra five minutes. Let me explain the why to you. And because the younger generations aren't necessarily going to immediately trust that just because you're a lieutenant or just because you're a captain or just because you're a non-commissioned officer that you know what's best for everyone, they're going to question. And to get them to the point where, because we can't afford them to question in a combat environment. We can't afford the young soldier to say, well, I'm a specialist, I know better than you. So how do you get there? You speak the way they can hear you. And sometimes that's explaining a little bit more. Sometimes it's saying the same thing. Hey, I need you to attack that hill. But it's saying it differently so that it makes more sense to the people who are receiving it. Again, most of the time in the Army, it's you better, and they do. But every once in a while, you need to take that breath. And in the civilian world, it's even more so. Your younger generation needs a little more, hey, this is why we're doing what we're doing now go attack the hill. Yeah, and then once they see that you're continuously right, um, those <laughs> questions stop and they just learn to trust. Yes. Uh, but, you're, but, but you're right, and I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. Um, sometimes that qualifier or that explanation does kind of need to be there. Definitely. 
Um, what was your experience with cultural or gender role differences in both Iraq and, and Afghanistan compared to here in the US? Um, and did these have any impact on your worldview or your deter determination during Ranger School? Huge impact on my worldview. Uh, I had only ever traveled to, I'd gone to Europe and Australia, I've gone, went to the UK prior to getting deployed, but to see that, to see specifically Afghanistan was the first place I went. And as a combat engineer, I was flown into an airfield that barely could handle airplanes. And then it was part of my job to rebuild the airfield that existed in Kandahar so that larger planes could land and more supplies and more troops could come in. So we were living in a really sparse world because we couldn't bring a lot of supplies in at that time or equipment. We couldn't bring a lot of our big equipment in. And Kandahar was a great example because you would see the houses and you would see the advanced culture that was there before Al Qaeda came back and before all of these, um, these conflicts just kept crushing the nation. We would go, I did minefield clearing ops and we would go and we would clear an area of minefields and then there was a storm and then there was more, more unexploded ordnance that would just seep up through the sand demonstrating decades and decades of war in this nation. And it's really hard to complain about the fact that um, during Snowmageddon in 2001 here in, um, in Texas, in central Texas, our power went out when the snow came and, oh my gosh, we didn't have power for two days. Like, wow, it's really hard to complain about that when you live in 114 degree weather and you haven't had an air conditioning your entire life. So it, it definitely impacted my worldview, um, with regards to gender. I was, I had an interesting scenario where I was running um, convoys for to make the concrete that we were using to repair the uh, the runway. So bringing in gravel and Portland and uh, Portland cement and uh, sand and water, we were bringing it in. Well, the Pakistani contractor didn't speak English. I didn't speak Urdu or Pashtun. So, but we both knew a little bit of Japanese. I, I took. I took Japanese in high school for a year. We knew a little bit of Japanese and between clicks, pops, his broken English and our broken Japanese and then an interpreter, interpreter we got once every three days, we talked about the gender differences. And it was really interesting because culturally I automatically hated their culture. It just seemed awful to me that they would do that to their women. Now, you can talk about the extreme cultures, you can talk about um, the burqas, you can talk about everything else, but this specific man who was willing to talk to me as an American woman said, my wives, and he explained why you can have up to four wives and how he treats them. He's like, they're like precious jewels and I would never allow the sun or the weather or other men to damage my precious jewels. And the way he explained it to me, I thought I could never think like you but I can comprehend your ways of thinking. Um, did it affect my desire to go to ranger school? I'm not sure that it, that it necessarily impacted it one way or the other, but I do believe that the US incorporating women in their combat arms in one way or another, and again, that's a pretty long debate right there, but incorporating women has some benefits, such as our combat support teams that went into Afghanistan in 2007 and were able to uncover some, some terrorist plots because they were talking to the women because the men couldn't talk to the women. So yeah, that, there's, there's some gender stuff in there, but overall it's a cultural and being exposed to different worldviews will, will be something I search out for the rest of my life. Awesome. I don't, I don't remember how many more questions we have left. I think there's like one or two. Uh, were you required to get some sort of governmental okay uh, prior to publishing your book? Did they have to like look it over to make sure you're not uh, giving, you, giving you away ranger secrets or anything like that? Yeah, I did. And um, there's actually a, uh, a little note in my book that says this is DOD approved. They did not approve all the pictures. So I did make sure that I used only open source pictures that you can get on the internet. Um, minus one or two, there is like a picture of one of my leave and earning statements where whoever uh, pushed it out uh, 
they actually typed a note in there. So anytime you get a military leave and earning statement, they usually put notes in there. You've used this many vacation days. You've got this going on. You're getting paid for this. You owe this much money. There's just different lines in the bottom. And I got my LES, my leave and earning statement. And on the bottom of it, it said, congratulations on graduating the reigning ranger, the pre-ranger course. Good luck at ranger school. And it was typed in the notes section. So stuff like that is included in the book as well, which DOD did not approve, but I don't think they disapprove either. That's pretty awesome though. Somebody was somebody out there was paying attention. Uh, for all the, you know, the thousands of service members, somebody picked you out. I was like, hey, she's going to go to ranger school. That's yeah. that's that's pretty good. That is good. I think this is the last one, if I'm not okay. mistaken. And did you have to deal with any pushback from the males at West Point uh, to a different degree than the males at Ranger School? Uh, and then also at Ranger School, what were your instructors like? Or how did how did they treat you? Were you just a regular Joe or? Oh, this is such a loaded question. <laughs> um, so West Point, honestly, when I had passed the pre-ranger course, which was mandatory for the women to pass before we went to ranger school, um, when I passed the pre-ranger course, I did get a couple of my guy classmates that I was real close with, including a guy I stood up in his wedding and he goes, hey, listen, I get it. I could totally work with you. I could totally share out a foxhole with you. But how the hell am I supposed to get my soldiers to do this? And, and I had to gently nudge him and say, you don't, you know, you're way up here, you're a battalion commander, your soldiers are going to do just fine. They do the right thing. And when they don't, you punish them. And, and that's all you have to do. And, uh, but another one of my classmates who was a really good friend of mine, um, our first two years, we did probably all of our homework together. He wrote me a note and, and the letters actually included in the book. And he was like, listen, um, I graduated from ranger school when you're supposed to, when you're 22 years old, right after we graduated from West Point, here's my ranger tab, um, carry it with you to know that I'm with you through this process. Uh, I kind of thought my daughter was going to be the first one who was going to do this. Like, it seemed like it would be something that would, would happen in 15, 20 years, but I'm proud that it's you and I'm proud that I know you. So I got, I got a lot of support from my West Point classmates. Now the ranger instructors, there were some that hated us. There were some that were neutral. There were some that thought, hey, like, it's about time. I've got a badass wife who does CrossFit, who's, I'm sorry for cursing. I've got a tough, tough as nails wife who, who does CrossFit, who popped out six kids, who can do more than me, who's, who's got all that resiliency. I'm sure she could graduate ranger school. So you had, you know, the spectrum, but for the ranger instructors, the terrible thing for them is where our classmates, once they got to know us, they didn't care that we were women. The ranger instructors would see us, they would see us perform, they would see us patrol, they would inspect our packing lists and see we were carrying the same stuff, walking the same grounds, eating the same meals, drinking the same water, like nothing was different for the women. But then they would go home and they'd have to watch the news and read People Magazine bashing us and listen to the Senate Armed Services Committee having conversations about women cheating. They'd have to deal with their, their peers who are like, oh, I don't want you to let a woman graduate. So they had to deal with all that and then come back the next morning and be professionals. So any ranger instructor, there's only two that were that I will, I would have problems being respectful to if I saw them on the street today. Any other ranger instructor that I think might have treated me poorly. Um, I, I have the deepest respect for them because I can't imagine what it was like where you have your entire peer group saying, hey, women shouldn't be there. And then they have to know someone like me and be like, but but Lisa's carrying the same stuff. Lisa shaved her head. Lisa's, you know, hasn't showered in 10 days either. So, um, yeah, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> I, I, I like the way you phrase that about the two. Uh, it's very, very <laughs> diplomatic, very nice. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, all of our members are still on. So I, obviously everybody has totally enjoyed, uh, you know, listening to you, uh, answering the questions and just going through, um, you know, what you did, not only with Ranger School, but also at West Point. Um, and, you know, I'll just go ahead and say it. you've already cursed, so I'll curse. You are a badass. Um, oh, thank that, you. That, that you've had an amazing career and I hope it keeps going for you. I hope the military realizes uh, people like you are indispensable. Um, and so you're not going to get a pink slip or ushered out simply because uh, you're old. You're not <laughs> old. <laughs> I'm old. I'm just blessed that I can wear makeup and cover it up. <laughs>
Well, again, thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you for everybody for joining us today. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate it. We always like to have a good audience for our book talks, uh, and especially when we have a fantastic author and speaker uh, like Lisa. Um, it's just been wonderful. Kevin's uh, got some applause, um, and I'm sure we're going to get plenty of nice notes. We always do at the end of a, our, our more successful uh, uh, book talks, although we don't have an unsuccessful one. Uh, but uh, some just garner more responses than others. I have a feeling this one's going to garner quite a few responses uh, by email over the next day or two. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much. If there's anything the Wisconsin Veteran Museum can do for you, please feel free to ask. Uh, and for everybody who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you next time. Don't forget trivia tomorrow night. If you haven't signed up for our monthly trivia event, please do so. Uh, it'll just be Beth and I this time. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow night. Uh, but once again, uh, everybody, uh, a special thank you to Lisa Jaster. Uh, fantastic. And uh, we look forward to talking with you again, hopefully soon. Thanks, Eric.